Ooh, time for good design, bad design the seventh. If this is your first time here, welcome. You can start here with this one now and go back to watch the others later. We're here to talk about lots of examples of good and bad graphic design in games. Things like menus, UI, camera work, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. There will be good games with bad graphic design, and vice versa. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. I've been using Skillshare for years now, and I've gotten so much more efficient at editing videos with the skills I've learned through their courses. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on dozens of topics. They've got a great set of motion graphics courses full of techniques that I've used to make the animations you see in every design doc video. There's more good stuff on video editing, animation, and graphic design, my favorites, but also entrepreneurial skills, photography, marketing, web development, and so much more. You can get access to everything with premium membership for just $10 a month, which is way cheaper and more convenient than in-person classes or workshops. You can try out with a free two-month trial by signing up with our link below. Good design. Sayonara Wild Hearts has a killer look and feel. It's a top 10 game on my cohesive style leaderboard. In a nutshell, Sayonara Wild Hearts is an abstract, music-based arcade style runner. It's essentially a playable music album with a stylish, ethereal narrative stitching each of the album's songs together, flooding your senses at all times. Oh, and Queen Latifah is the narrator. Sayonara Wild Hearts' gameplay is on rails, which really makes the playable music video theme possible. Every camera angle, every action beat, every scene transition is intricately tied to a level song. In one level, you will be in an intense motorcycle chase in a city during a verse, but as the chorus begins, the city streets suddenly crumble and you take the chase into the air. It's that kind of spectacle that's front and center here. The game's flashy style is always on the verge of overwhelming your senses, but the game does a few things to keep it manageable. Wild Hearts only uses two inputs, the directions for movement and timed button prompts. The game keeps shifting what it will ask you to do. In some stages, you're only moving left and right. In others, you have full 360 movement. Sometimes you're drifting in a car, and sometimes you're targeting multiple enemies like in Panzer Dragoon. There's a lot of contextual variety, but you're always weaving through obstacles, grabbing as many collectibles as you can for a higher score with only a few simple mechanical tasks to think about at any time. The collectibles themselves all meld with the visuals as well, and help keep the player focused on the game's sights and sounds. Wild Hearts is able to get away with the intense visuals partially because of how simple the core gameplay is. The more complicated and demanding the game's mechanics are, the less a game can dazzle with graphics without overwhelming the player, or letting the graphical effort go to waste. There's only so much of a player's attention to go around. Think of games like Rock Band, the mechanics of playing the instruments can be very demanding. Players get tunnel vision when focusing on their track of notes. It's very common for a player not to see what's going on in the background at all. In a game like Sayonara Wild Hearts, whose core is so focused on pairing visual style with music, a complicated set of mechanics would undercut what they wanted the player to focus on. By dialing down the gameplay knob, the designers at Samogo freed up the attention of the player that let them take in the must-play audio-visual experience of Sayonara Wild Hearts. Bad design. Some games like to hide secrets. Sometimes, like in Metroid and Zelda, hidden things are core to a game's design. But there's a trick to designing secrets and hidden things. If you hide them too well, no one will find them. They might as well not be there. If you don't hide them well enough, well, then they aren't really secrets now, are they? So how do you communicate a secret? You don't do what the original Rayman does. Cause, man. But hold up a sec, we first have to talk about affordances. Affordances are the little clues that suggest how to interact with an object or system. The handles and panels on doors are the classic example. Put a handle on the side to pull, and a flat panel on the side to push, and people will tend to intuit what they need to do to open the door, without any other instructions. Video games have tons of affordances in their visual design. Lots of the affordances you've probably stopped even noticing consciously. Unusual platforms, subtle inconsistencies in the environment. In the visual language of games, 
Little imperfections suggest that something is happening here, and you should investigate more. So that gets us back to secrets. A game can use affordances to telegraph that there's a secret to be found. You can be really, really subtle. Games like Fez and The Witness are partially great because discovering these obscure affordances becomes a core part of the game. But the game should at least put something there. Mario 64 is pretty good at using affordances to highlight its secrets. Here, in the Cool Cool Mountain Penguin slide, there's a line of coins that lead directly into the wall. Coins are there to be collected, so a player collects them, and hey hey, there's a secret path. The form of the coin line leads you directly into the hole in the wall. That's an affordance. Back in the overworld, once you have 10 stars, this beam of light shows up in the main central hub. What could that be? Better get my camera out and, oh jeez, I'm flying. Oh boy. That's an affordance. Without some subtle affordance, a player will either completely ignore a secret or randomly perform an action expecting something to eventually happen. It's like when you mash the A button in a Pokemon game next to a random bush or trash can, hoping that you'll stumble upon a hidden item. There are no affordances for secret items on the floor, but once in a great while you'll find one, so you keep checking everywhere. Without the affordances, players waste time mashing a button in an empty room. Pokemon isn't great at it, but at least the items involved are just extras. And that brings us back to Rayman. Rayman is divided into stages, and your job is to travel through each of them and open the cages you find along the way. Punch the cage, and you liberate the Electunes inside. There are six cages spread out over a handful of sections in each stage. Hope you can find all of them, because you have to. You have to find every cage to unlock the final level. It's not like you get a bad ending or anything if you can't find them all. You just do not get one. So they're just scattered throughout the worlds, right? How hard could that be? Oh, it sucks. A big chunk of these cages are invisible. At least until you find the right trigger. What is the trigger? Wouldn't you like to know? There are invisible triggers everywhere in this game. Some of them hide deadly hazards that pop out two feet in front of you. Some make the actual route to the end of the level appear, out of nowhere. And some, like this one, make those missing cages appear. Your only clue that a trigger was tripped is that one musical cue. It only plays once, and it doesn't tell you what happened. You figure it out. My favorite is this one from the first Banland stage, where there's a trigger behind the goal sign. It spawns a cloud behind you off screen, and leads you to a hidden cage. Rayman gives you almost literally nothing to go off of. Nothing about where the secret trigger might be located, nothing about how to trigger it, nothing about how it reveals things that are necessary to get to the end of the game, and nothing about where the secret will appear. By providing almost no information about its secrets, the first Rayman is a case in point of the importance of affordances. Good design. Every game has to teach something to the player. No matter how easy to play or how intuitive you say a game is, every game has unique controls, unique graphical signals, unique systems, unique strategies, all kinds of things that, at some point, the player has to be taught in order to play the game. That teaching process is called conveyance, and it's complicated because there are so many different ways a game could do it. It could use text box tutorials, visual cues, demonstrations of character behaviors, or a hundred other things and probably a mix of several of them to get the full picture of the game into the mind of the player. Generally, the quicker, easier, and less noticeable a game can teach you its rules, the better. But there are always trade-offs. Text tutorials are thorough, but they tend to put a stop to the fun to teach you something. And just like a lecture in a big classroom, showing the text by itself is not a guarantee that the player is going to absorb the material. A little visual note can be seamless, but it might just be overlooked entirely. It's surprising sometimes how obvious you have to make a point for it to actually get through to someone. Plus, if you as a designer already know the information, it might be tricky to gauge whether or not the hint is clear enough. Every conveyance technique has benefits and drawbacks, and every game might prioritize different things that might work better with its style. But it's not just about style. Proper conveyance can mean the difference between a game that's difficult but fair, and a game that feels cheap. Celeste is a great example. Despite being a very dense and difficult platformer, Celeste is inviting and easy to pick up because of its high-quality conveyance. Celeste starts out with a pretty standard jumping tutorial. Short hop here, long hop here. You have to prove you know what you're capable of doing to continue. But should you fail and fall into a pit here, there's a more subtle lesson to learn. 
you're immediately taught that death is just a minor setback. That's not as obvious as, how high can my character jump, but it's no less important. Teaching that quick and early makes other lessons easier to teach, as it encourages players to experiment and take chances. Celeste has dozens of subtle lessons like these that wordlessly teach the player, but it does dip its toes into a couple of classic dialogue box tutorials. Just for a second. Like when it teaches you how to climb and, more importantly, how to dash. Lots of games might just teach you the dash straight away, but Celeste makes it its own microdrama. You're running across a collapsing bridge. It's clear you're not going to make it. You desperately jump to the other side and then... Boom. Lesson learned. They could have taken a more direct, intrusive approach. That little bird from the climbing tutorial could chime in with a short paragraph on exactly how your dash works. That would have worked, but not as well. Instead, it teaches with the minimal amount of words, adds just a smidge of tension, and only stops the action when you would have been stopped by falling into the pit anyway. From there, you're a few screens into the game and you already have all your basic tools in just a couple of minutes. Everything after that is about the little nuances of your new skills, the way the skills interact with each other, and with the steady stream of gimmicks the game throws at you. They're all taught purely through the level design and visual effects on your character. Your jump's height, mid-air control, stamina while climbing with these little animated clouds, the tell when you're about to run out of stamina, how far you can climb, dashing in any direction, how your character's hair relates to dashing, replenishing your stamina and dash upon landing, how momentum works on moving platforms, these crystals that replenish your dash in the air, these strange cosmic blocks that auto-dash you in a straight line, and many more. None of these mechanics are explicitly told to you, it's all conveyed through intuition and by building on the game's own behaviors up to that point piece by piece. And, to make sure you got the lesson, you subtly won't be able to proceed without understanding each and every one of these mechanics. Celeste has worked to remove as much frustration as possible. Liberal checkpointing and infinite lives help, but its conveyance strategy plays a big part too. Despite being a very difficult and mechanically dense platformer, Celeste developers made the conveyance of all those mechanics as seamless and lightweight as they could. Bad design. So, first of all, I love JoJo. My favorite part? Four. Favorite JoJo, Joseph. Favorite stand, it's a tie between Killer Queen from Part 4 and Moody Blues from Part 5. So, I grabbed JoJo Eyes of Heaven on sale. Ugh. JoJo Eyes of Heaven is a game made for JoJo fans. Only for fans. It's got tons of series hallmarks. The poses, crazy abilities, the colorful presentation in its UI design, this stuff and some great character crossovers and interactions. But I hope you get a lot from that because the rest of the game has some issues. And God help you if you're not already a fan. Because if you can't appreciate all those obscure references and super stylish attack cutscenes, there's really not that much else here. Eyes of Heaven's conveyance is pretty terrible. It's not great at visually communicating to new players what is going on in its gameplay, even though the core of it isn't all that complicated. So Eyes of Heaven is a 2v2 arena-based fighter, similar to the Naruto Ninja Storm games or the J-Star series. You have your standard light and heavy attacks, you can pick up and use objects scattered throughout the arena, and you have character-specific special attacks. Each character has a variety of signature moves that are direct references to the source material. But there's the first problem. If you aren't already familiar with the series, you will be instantly lost. Even if you are, the game will lead you astray. The presentation of each character's special moves is bizarre. To use a special move, you hold down L1 and choose from a list of unique moves. There's a move on each face button and a couple of EX moves on the shoulder buttons. But the moves are all named with translated quotes from the manga. The quotes are vaguely associated with the move, but it's pretty loose. Some aren't too bad if you're familiar with the series. Jotaro's Aura Aura brings out the iconic flurry of punches. Some are actually descriptive in a way, like his other move, I Stop Time, which stops time. But then there are moves like Dio's There's No Escape, who knows what that does. Turns out it's a knife throwing attack, 
Bruno has a long distance punch called, Disgraces Like You Screw Up Everything They Do. If you had an encyclopedic knowledge of the specific JoJo translation used from when this game came out, maybe you could take a guess? But, come on. You even have to wait for half of these move names to scroll across the screen. It puts another unnecessary step between the player and them actually figuring out how to play the character. It's not just the names either. The animations and effects don't do a great job at conveying what some of the moves actually do. Most characters have a couple of special attacks that leave you wondering what happened, even when you know what characters' powers are in the manga. It could be the attack's range, its additional effects, if it has synergy with other moves, is the button input versatile? Oh, but they provided a pause menu data log. Yeah, that's just as good as being intuitive. Problem solved. Whether it be from a weird translation or from expecting too much source material familiarity from all its players, the game puts up a lot of unnecessary roadblocks. Between the animation ambiguity and the quote-based naming scheme for its moves, JoJo Eyes of Heaven makes for a confusing and frustrating pick-up-and-play brawler. Good design. Well, this has been a long time coming. Judging the UI and graphic design of Monster Hunter World is a little... complicated. There are still a lot of issues with it, but it's easy to overlook the improvements the series has made. Monster Hunter World brought so many new players to a series that was once seen as inaccessible to newcomers. Part of that is thanks to the substantial UI quality of life improvements while you're out on hunts. The new Scout Fly system improves monster tracking by a lot. When you first search for a monster, you have to find its tracks. The more tracks you find, the more you'll improve your Scout Flies, which help lead you towards the target and highlight other collectibles. In previous games, you had to blindly wander through each area until you got a sense for each monster's movement and where their habitats were located. The scout flies and the open sandbox design of the map streamlines the process and makes repeating hunts way less tedious. As you hunt each monster, you will raise your research level on that specific monster, giving you the monster's weaknesses, drops, breakable parts, and more in the new in-game bestiary instead of making you look it up in an online guide. All sorts of other feedback is improved in World 2. Colored damage numbers tell you how effectively you're attacking the monsters. White for ineffective attacks, Orange for weak spot hits for full damage. They're small so they don't feel intrusive, and if you're a bit of a purist and don't want this information, you have the option to just turn it off. The HUD is clean, and packs a ton of information in the amount of space it uses. Health, stamina, timer, weapon sharpness, a detailed minimap, the cool icons for each monster in this neat tribal style. I even appreciate the little controls cheat sheet in the top right corner. It helps newer players try out new weapon types, and the attack options even keep up with the weapon attack context changes. These changes aren't geared for the hardcore series fan, so it makes sense that some of them wouldn't necessarily like it. The argument goes that limiting the amount of information will force players to get better at the game, that putting in the info makes the game do the work for you, and that new players won't be as engaged in combat if they can just use the new info as a crutch. But I don't agree that that's a problem. That's not why I come to Monster Hunter. The monster hunting experiences, and the hunts remain as engaging as they ever were. And now, more people are able to see them for the quality gaming experiences they are, without a lot of the crud getting in the way, hiding what Capcom has been able to make. Bad design. You didn't think I'd go that easy on Monster Hunter, did you? Of course, there are plenty of things the series could still improve on. My top priority would be to streamline all the prep work you have to do before you go on hunts. Not removing it, streamlining it. The menus and hub make prep way more convoluted than necessary. All I want to do is kill this beautiful creature and turn it into a little hat. Maybe some boots. Is that too much to ask? Astera is the main hub of the base game, and I don't like it. Hub areas that act as diegetic menus can be a fun way to make the world feel more immersive, at least until the novelty wears off. Astera is broken into two floors. The quest board and item box are near the trade yard, right next to the entrance, which is fine. The rest of the commonly used facilities like the workshop used for crafting and the canteen used for temporary bonuses on your next hunt are placed too far away for how much you'll use them. They're on the second floor which means at the start of every quest, you have to walk through the trade yard to either go up these winding stairs 
or take this chain lift up to the canteen. The Tail Raider Safari, used for farming materials, is separated by an entire loading screen, either in your private room or in the research base, all by its lonesome. Taking so long to go from station to station after every single hunt gets real old real fast. It's not immersive, it's just padding. Thankfully, the new hub town in the Iceborne expansion has a much better layout and centralizes everything. The game's busy, dense, and convoluted menus are their own ball of problems. The worst of them is the investigations menu. Investigation quests are procedurally generated hunts that you gain during other hunts. They're great for farming monsters, but setting them up is real dumb. You have to walk over to the resource center, manually pick them from a list of targets, then walk back to the quest board and pick them up like a normal quest. You get a limited number of slots for investigations, so you'll eventually have to do some spring cleaning. To delete a quest, you have to sort the quests, search 20 pages to find the one you don't want anymore, delete it, then start over, because the game took you back to the first page. Repeat a few dozen times. It ain't fun. There are tons more tiny issues, of course. The crafting wishlist only has six slots, the game saves your radial menu settings with your item loadouts and doesn't tell you if you don't know how it works. It kinda just looks like the game just deleted all of your radial menu settings. The game just doesn't explain how mechanics like negative affinity work. The gathering hub exists as this weird half-usable mini-hub. You have to trudge through the busy work of crafting all of these expendable items the game rains down on you. Super dense and busy menus like this, this, and this. It's a long list, and while it's shorter than it was, it's longer than you'd like. Monster Hunter World is a game whose very essence seems tied with its Byzantine mechanics and menus, but it doesn't have to be. Tweaking the menus, UI, and mechanics to be cleaner and friendlier to newcomers can still retain all the complexity and depth that series fans know and love, and would still make Monster Hunter a series worth studying.